Hi everybody, it's Andy from Snow Camps Europe, back with a, another um, episode of the podcast. I'm with Paul from the Ski Instructor Academy in Austria. And today, Paul, we've got a topic that's been sent in by one of our watchers or listeners. It's uh, Lara Croft. Now, I don't think it's the Lara Croft. I was going to say. <laughs> I don't think it's, a, it's the Tomb Raider Lara Croft, but Lara Croft. And she asked, um, basically, what our thoughts were on learning to ski, either on a dry ski slope or in a, an indoor slope, before coming on holiday as a beginner, hmm. which is quite an interesting one. Yeah, and, and obviously we have to take on board um, the advancement in technology of indoor-outdoor slopes that I think both you and I, I, I learned um, also on an outdoor ski slope, but we're talking about in 1980, whatever, um, and it was a mat, obviously the yep. old twist your thumb, break your legs and type mat type thing, and of course it was on the long skis, etc., um, was it beneficial? Pro probably because um, I was self-taught skier until a long time because it was typical. I was a climber and climbers would go, ah, I don't need any tuition. You know, you go with your friend and you just learn yourself a bit. But in general, I would say nowadays um, with all this experience behind me, it was beneficial, but it also had some problems to it, I think. And I think one of the biggest problems for most people considering, let's say, let's say they're a beginner mm -hmm. and they're coming on a ski holiday, is that if you turn up and you have done, let's say, you know, most people might get two or three sessions in, let's say, at an indoor slope or something, you, you don't know where to, as a ski school, you don't know where to put that person, do you? Mm -hmm. Because they're not quite a beginner, but they're definitely not somebody you can let go on with the next group up. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, let's say, average group size of beginners is eight. If eight people turn up and they're all total beginners, they're all in the same place. Now, granted, some people will learn slightly quicker than others, um, depending on their sports background, their fitness levels and their age and things like that. But if you are, let's say, the two people who've been to a ski dome, and you've had three sessions and you've learned to put your skis on, you've done all of the, the start off balancing exercises and you can do a snowplow turn down that indoor slope. Well, that's gonna be great. However, for the first day of your ski yeah. holiday, you're gonna be probably a little bit bored. And as, as Paul said, you probably can't go into the next level group because even though you can string some snowplow turns together down an indoor slope, the next level group, I'm using Caprunan as an example, where they would go and ski, you probably wouldn't get down. No. So you would still need some training to get you to that level yeah. of that group. So you end up um, being the worst in that other group, and actually not just the worst, but probably feeling really um, insecure yeah. and, and not getting, losing confidence because snow is different once you hit snow. Um, and then you've got the other group, which makes you feel like, oh, I'm way beyond this. I'm, uh, you know, I, I, come on, I need to get moving. And I think that way, maybe the only way to get around that would be, oh, okay, I'm now in that weird position where I've done and invested in some time back in wherever country and the indoor slope. I probably now need to invest in a private when I arrive in resort to accelerate me up and spring me up to that next group. And that would work, I yeah. would say. One day private, you'll be ready to jump into the Second people who've already skied for a week or even two weeks. Yeah, That could be the way around it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good idea. And um, most ski schools, and we'll use Austria as our example, we always start group lessons on a Sunday. So if you, if you had that private on a Sunday, you can always join that group again on the Monday. Normally, they don't let you join a group after a Monday because, again, the group have moved on, the group is settled, and they always then recommend privates. But as Paul said, private on the first day, get your legs, not necessarily get your legs back, but get moving to the level of that next group and then slot into that group. Yeah. Um, so diff what's the difference between a dry ski slope and an indoor slope then? Yeah, well, I mean, the dry slope I was on obviously was a mat um, and it was, you know, sprayed with water, so it was slippy. And where, where was it? Um, I want to say Edinburgh. Okay, Hill End probably. Hill End, Hill End. yeah, okay. Um, so... Uh, that's and I um, obviously uh, to be 
perfectly honest, I've never skied on an indoor ski slope because why would I? Okay. <laughs> why? <laughs> and I'm not thinking against indoor ski slopes, um, but, you know, I mean, I was in Dubai there. There's a huge indoor ski slope as well. Um, but come on, if you're skiing eight to ten months of a year, the last thing you want to do is go into a freezer and... It's yeah. skiing an indoor slope, but there's, there's absolutely no reason. Whereas I, I understand people who don't have that luxury of skiing outdoors, you know, maybe they, they, they see it as an advantage. And obviously a lot of my team have skied on indoor slopes a lot. Um, and I know one of them's off to Dubai actually to uh, to teach in Dubai at the minute. But I, I would think that the indoor slope, the actual artificial snow slopes, are far better than the outdoor slopes. Yeah, um, I, dry ski slopes, obviously you said about these brushes, the Dendex matting, which um, I had the pleasure of breaking my thumb on three times when I was uh, a kid, um, is, as you said, it needs to be wet, it needs to be moist so you slip. What you're going to feel the difference of if you've been in a on a dry slope and then you go inside is that the snow is a lot slippier. Quicker. Uh, yeah, quicker. Um, what I noted when I skied on indoor slopes, and I've skied, I think I've only skied in Tamworth, and it was when Tamworth opened, which must have been early 90s, is it was quite icy. Yeah. But I think the systems have improved now, and it's not so icy, but it is still obviously artificial snow. And if you've ever been on a holiday at the beginning of the season, uh, for those people who have skied, you'll know how artificial snow feels, and it's a very different feeling to real snow. But what we used to say back in, in the day when I was skiing on dry ski slopes and teaching on dry ski slopes, if you could learn to ski on a dry ski slope, once you got on your holiday, it was a lot easier yeah. because there was less friction. Um, and typically the, the mountain was slightly steeper than most dry ski slopes. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's the old thing again of challenging yourself a bit and actually then it makes it easier when you're actually on the real yeah. thing. Yeah, I think the other noticeable difference is that from what my understanding from what I see online um, in forums is um, the indoor slopes are not cheap. So like no. one or two hours, it's it's a lot of money where I think if you go to your local dry ski slope and my local dry ski slope, even though it wasn't really local, but was the Bebbington Oval, 40 metre slope at a council ran leisure centre. And OK, I'm talking many years ago, it was it was a few pound a session. Um, obviously, that will be more expensive now, but I believe the indoor slopes are extortionally expensive and I'm. I've got something like sixty pound in my head for two hours, um, which um, maybe, maybe right, maybe wrong. If if you if you ski up an indoor slope and you take lessons, and let us know how much they do actually cost. Yeah. So I'm just looking there. At what is the longest um, indoor ski slope in the world? And also, um, I'm interested in what it is in the UK. So I can see it's two hundred meters um, run. Now, I was saying to Andy that um, if you have a run. That is, you know, like, for example, here in Caprun, it's five kilometers long from top to bottom. You can see how many times you're going to have to go up and down that lift to actually achieve that same. And not just don't forget, if a run is 200 meters, there's a starting and there's a stopping of it. So probably 120, 30 meters of it are of some use to you to yeah. do something with it. I, I do see that actually the, the world's largest one is 640 meters in length. But again, I don't know how much of that's usable terrain where, where is it I'll is it in is it germany yeah it's, yeah, it's, it's a german it's a one indoor yeah. ski sorts germany and netherlands yeah. i don't know which one's the the, the the tallest one um the longest one but again it's it's if you are already a skier um i find that a lot of people who already ski a bit they quickly realize the benefits of an indoor slope are outweighed quickly when you're just going on a, on a week's holiday you know like very quickly you're gonna you're gonna cover the, a lot more kilometers and as andy says if it is expensive then is it better to invest your money somewhere else you know and not not to um put down indoor slopes because i'm you know I, don't, I, I think it's a great thing that there's an opportunity for people to do this um but obviously if i was spending my money in my position, I, I wouldn't. Um, if I was a beginner, 
I would I, I I would probably still want to break that rule of saying I want to get ahead of the other beginners. Just typical competition, <laughs> like you know. All right, I want to know what this is all about before I get out there. So I do think as a complete beginner, there's nothing wrong with that, and that's why it's a bit like skydiving and stuff that I've done. You know, these indoor wind tunnels now, etc. It's like it's quite cool. So instead of having to you know decide, am I going to like skydiving and start investing? thousands of euros in skydiving you can go to an indoor tunnel and you can see what it's like to fly and things and then you get addicted to it and i think there's nothing wrong with beginners uh complete beginners doing this but just be aware that unless um you're in a group where multiple people have done this and there's going to this like group of eight people have all done a couple of hours on a ski slope then you are going to be out of sync yeah and that makes it difficult and the only way to get around it is if you've got the money to afford to pay for a few um, sessions at this these dry slopes or indoor slopes, then why not just get a private when you arrive in resort and keep that momentum to jump you ahead of a group or two. If you're an intermediate skier already and you've done, you know, two plus weeks to ten, what do you reckon, Andy? Would you invest your money through the sea through the summer? I think that there are there are ways that you probably could and would want to do it um and it's what i did i, I learned to ski on snow in the mountains and then i joined um, a dry ski slope club um the o- the oval ski club at bevington and i skied there once or twice a week um but that was partly or mainly to train slalom as well so what i would say is if, if you are going to invest money on keeping your skiing legs up to scratch during the off season then join a club because you normally get the rates a little bit cheaper than if you were just uh, a, a, a member of the public coming to do a two-hour session or whatever it be you'll also by being a member of a club you will get coaching uh, they normally have t- coaches and trainers um, within the club and they'll do different level training and you probably ought to pick up a few things that you will then be able to use in the mountains so then i'm looking at this one Um, which we were asked to invest into as well, actually, uh, last year, Um, which are these infinite slopes. Yeah, these, um, like a running machine, but (coughs) for for skiers. It's funny because these are making a re-emergence, and a lot of people think it's the first time these have come around, but I actually worked on one of these in 1990 or 1989. Um, It was Black's Sports, Black's Mountain Sports, they had them installed in several of their shops, and the Chester shop was one of them. And if you booked your holiday with a certain holiday company, you got three or four one-hour lessons for free. Right. So you would come down to Black's Mountain Sports in Chester, and you would have um, a lessons. And at the time, these carpets were a lot narrower. I would say they were about a metre and a half oh, wow. in width. <laughs> like a running machine. two of them next to each other, and then it was probably four metres in length. And the two of them spun at the same time, but your skis were tiny little skis ah, right. and the edges had been removed. Oh. Where now, obviously, the carpets, it's the same carpet, but they're a lot bigger and you use a regular pair of skis. And I worked a whole winter teaching people on these these rolling carpets way back then. But <laughs> what were you about to say? I know, I was just, <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, like I was criticising indoor slopes for the length of them, for example. Yeah. Well, hey... This you can one ski goes forever. On forever. You, can, yeah. <laughs> you can have the longest ski run of your life. Yeah. However, it is a perfectly smooth surface. And yeah. even though you can tilt the angle, you can go steeper and they can put um, a camber on it. Um, it is, it's a very, very smooth surface, which is very different to any ski run. You the risk to, to I, think, I think the risk to injury... Um, before your ski holiday has to be considered. So as Andy said, I mean, I know I stumped my thumb several times on the mats. Um, and the you have to think about that. So that I would say if you do an indoor um, or outdoor simulation style skiing, you might want to put a pause on that and a break on that a few weeks before you travel, just in case you, you do hurt yourself. Yeah. Um, there is that side. There's the cost side. Um, and And I think then after that, it's... The commitment side after that, you know, a lot of people just don't have the time before the ski holiday, really. It just, everything accelerates the promise. Look, we get students booked onto courses, especially the most guilty of this are what we call our dual candidates. So they're good snowboarders, 
but they've never skied before. But they understand because of the market in the ski industry as ski instructors and board instructors, there's most of the work is for ski instructors mm -hmm. and not snowboard instructors. So we always highly recommend a snowboarder to get the most you know basic level of ski instruction as well. That way they can maximize the season and make sure they're earning money through the quiet times because there's just not the lessons for snowboarders all the time so we will recommend that and of course most of them will go yeah that's a good idea you know and they'll commit to the dual course where they're qualifying in both board and ski and they'll promise before they arrive in resort that they'll, they'll get learn to ski they'll learn to ski <laughs> that they'll they'll go to some in dry slope lessons or indoor slope whatever and that they will arrive with a little bit of knowledge that we can then again boost them through our special courses and what they do, they just don't do it. Yeah. They end up getting distracted. You know, it, it's not always easy. You know, they, they find reasons not to go. And I, I would imagine it, it's like, you know, the, 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 it's like getting buying a motorbike. You know, it, it's really cool to have a motorbike. And you want to go flying around on it. You see all the adverts. You go, I want to buy that motorbike. But then when you get one, you realize, like, just to go to the shops, you've got to put your leathers on. You've got to get ready, you've got your helmet out. Then you've got to get the, Then you could take all the locks off the bike. And then by the time you've done that, you think, I could walk to the fucking shops. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, and it's the same with this. Like, you, you want to go to the indoor ski. It looks great, but then they realize, actually, I've got to get there. I've got to get all my kit on. I've got to put the boots on. I've got to get the ski. Out. And, it, and I think it starts to think, it, it must be almost like a, a three, four hour thing just to to go for a little bit of a run for a yeah I, I remember with the with the dry ski slope in in october november we would see a, a big influx of members they would all come they would take advantage of the club lessons and they would learn to ski a little bit before going on their holidays and then th they'll come back off their holidays with their photos and they'll be oh we had a great time we've already booked for next year but come end of february middle of march the club would become smaller again and it would only be really those people who were racing through the summer race leagues and then their parents let's say yeah. um, or friends that would then be there in the summer and then once the school holidays hit then you would have gone from having maybe 150 people on a sunday night for ski club skiing to maybe 30 you know yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, you find that in resorts, though. Do you not? Do you not think that like, there's a point where people just switch to summer mode? Yeah, especially when you live here and you see it, and all of a sudden the, the slopes are empty and everyone's on their bike, yeah, or, or they're on their stand-up paddleboard, and you do. There's, the, it's almost like a, a switch gets flicked. Yeah, it's as quick as that as yeah. well. It is as quick as that, and uh, I think these indoor slopes will be like that. Look, my my conclusion to this one, Andy, would be if you're the type of person who's really committed. You, you really, you know, and you want to maximize your first ski holiday. I would say there is absolutely no harm in going along. But do be aware, if it is your first time, it's three trillion times better in the real world than it is there. So don't be put off because that's the other worry. Mm -hmm. Somebody goes and goes, oh, this kills, my boots kill, this hurts. It's freezing, it's icy. It's it's generally not like that on a ski holiday. Um, so be aware of that, please. Don't let it put you off, which would be a worry I might have. If, let's say, you might have a husband-wife team, you know, the wife might be a seasoned skier and the husband's never skied before, and he goes along and thinks, oh, this is terrible, I'm not going to enjoy this. Yeah. It's hard to, to simulate the ambience. Yeah, you're, you're obviously you're not in the mountains. You've not got the, the smells yeah. <laughs> that yeah. go on on the mountain. You've not got the, the, the noise. <laughs> <laughs> you've not got... The, you've not, you, there's so much that you haven't got when you're inside yeah. a fridge. Or exactly. a freezer. Yeah. yeah. So don't let that put you off. Um, but certainly if that's the type of person you are committed and, you know, then, hey, get on board. Um, and, you know, same if you are somebody who skied for a week and that's you've had your first holiday, it may be beneficial for you not to lose that muscle memory through to your next ski holiday to just top up every weekend in a month one one weekend in a month or yeah. something like that so that when you arrive back the following season you're not spending three days just finding your feet which is what tends to happen with people with very limited experience they spend half the holiday getting back to where they were when they left last time yeah i think this is something we mentioned in one of the other po earlier podcasts is a lot of people they expect to be able to ski on the first day as they did on the last day of their previous holiday, mm. but it, it, it just doesn't happen. And people get very frustrated by lunchtime on the first day, especially if it's snowed. Oh. Um, <laughs> and they just, they're like, what, what's happened to my skiing? Well, it does take a little bit of time for you to get back into the swing of things. So as Paul yeah. said, if, if you keep your finger in by going once one weekend in every month over, 
um, at home, then yeah, it is going to benefit you when you get back on the skis for sure. And as Andy said, no matter which one of the uh, simulators you use, they're consistent. And as Andy's just said, if you arrive in a resort and it's dumped 30 centimetres of snow, prepare for a frustrating day. You know, it's, it's not going to be the same. So you can't simulate that um, part of it. But um, if you are somebody committed and somebody who's willing to put the time in, I do not see any reason why. Why not? Yeah, give it a go. Why not? In for a penny, in for a pound. That's it from us from this time. We'll see you on the next one. Next one. Bye for now.